Hi everyone, my name is Connor Walsh, and today I'll be talking about the Dallas Mavericks and their toxic work environment that fostered sexual harassment, inappropriate behavior, violence against women, and little oversight and accountability over a period from 1998 to 2018. This scandal was exposed by Sports Illustrated in an investigation they conducted into the Mavericks organization back in 2018. They interviewed over 200 current and former employees who outlined a corrosive culture that was predicated on misogyny and predatory behavior by male employees who largely held leadership roles. Some examples of incidents that occurred over these 20 years involved public fondling, domestic assault, an employee who repeatedly watched pornography at his desk, and unsupportive and intimidating responses from superiors regarding complaints about sexual harassment. The key perpetrators in the organization were Tudema Useri, who's pictured in the center, Buddy Pittman, pictured on the right, and Earl Sneed, who's pictured on the left. The Mavericks culture issue started right at the top with Useri, who was the former team president and CEO. He was actually hired by the previous ownership group in 1997, but then retained in 2000 by current owner Mark Cuban, despite previous complaints of inappropriate workplace behavior by female employees. Even with a stricter sexual harassment policy in place, Useri continued this behavior with multiple women, claiming to Sports Illustrated that Useri had harassed them for years by making inappropriate remarks, requests for sex, and touching their calves and thighs during meetings. Buddy Pittman, the former head of HR, was brought in to oversee Useri, but still failed to hold him accountable. He was repeatedly made aware of these incidents, but did nothing, even directing two employees not to speak up. Pittman instead was more focused on sending charged emails to targeted employees, sharing his views on social and political issues like abortion, immigration, and homosexuality, which caused employees to be uncomfortable coming to him with sensitive issues. Another issue Pittman failed with was that of Earl Sneed, the former Maz.com beat writer who was guilty of domestic assault, including of a female employee, yet wasn't fired. The first stakeholder group to look at here would be the women who were subjected to this inappropriate behavior in the workplace. These women had to devote time and energy towards dealing with sexual predators while not even having HR to help them out because they prioritized protecting management instead of employees. After a while, women simply stopped making formal complaints to HR since it accomplished nothing, which caused them to feel trapped and scared. This work environment even brought many of the women to leave the sport industry entirely due to a structure that made them feel vulnerable while protecting powerful men who are guilty of this behavior. The next stakeholder here is owner Mark Cuban, who allowed this all to happen under his watch. While an investigation by the NBA concluded that Cuban was not aware of this behavior, he was rightfully blamed by the league for failing to create a workplace culture and HR procedures that would deter, detect, and stop misconduct. Horrified and embarrassed by his lack of oversight, Cuban immediately cleaned house and hired new CEO Cynthia Marshall to help repair the toxic culture and bring in more diversity. Cuban also donated $10 million to organizations that are committed to supporting the leadership and development of women in the sports industry and combating domestic violence in lieu of being punished by the NBA, who will be our next stakeholder. Having a more passive stake in the situation, it was still essential for the NBA to launch a, launch a thorough investigation to remove anyone responsible and to make sure behaviors like this do not make their way to other organizations. So far, they remain diligent, requiring the Mavericks to file quarterly reports re regarding the implementation of league recommendations as well as any further incidents of misconduct by employees. Looking at the barriers to intercultural communication, the first one in this case is severe prejudice. The culture that Cynthia Marshall walked into was one where women were not valued nor treated nearly the same as men. Besides the aforementioned incidents of sexual harassment, there was also a clear gender pay parity that existed as well. Marshall also pointed out that the Mavericks had previously failed to foster a diverse or inclusive environment, as people of color were not respected nor treated fairly in the workplace. This was made clear by the lack of a diversity on the executive leadership team, with no one other than Useri being a woman or person of color. The other barrier here would be anxiety, specifically that felt by female employees. Many described it as a locker room culture that reflected a zoo more so than an office with the actual locker room with the players being the only place of refuge from the constant anxiety they felt in the office. Many even feared for their safety after being threatened by their superiors for filing complaints about the sexual harassment they had to endure while also being told to just take it. Even when it came time for the investigation, many didn't release their names due to fear of retaliation or ostracization. 
Here we take a look at what has already been done by the Mavericks, and in particular Cynthia Marshall, to help repair their culture. Upon being hired, she immediately launched a 100-day plan to develop a women's agenda and values-based employment system, while at the same time granting an outside counsel full access to the team's business operations in order to increase transparency. She also began mixing internal promotions and outside recruitment to increase the diversity of the Mavericks leadership team, which has gotten to the point now where just 50% of the team are women and 47% are people of color. From there, Marshall and her team have since set up a 24-7 hotline for employees to report any concerns or incidents, establish an external advisory council of local business leaders, and implemented ongoing ethics, compliance, and unconscious bias training sessions. While these changes have been very effective in the short term, the Mavericks also need to begin taking steps towards making sure the intended effects of these changes stick in the long term. Their first step in ensuring long-term inclusivity should be to overhaul their recruitment process by investing in an applicant tracking system. Applicant tracking systems, or ATS software, help eliminate implicit biases by utilizing technology like natural language processing and artificial intelligence to both screen and sort through applications and resumes. This will allow the Mavericks to go blind, in a sense, in their reviews process by focusing on a candidate's specific qualifications and skills instead of surface-level characteristics. From there, for the interview stages, Marshall and her team should develop work sample tests that replicate tasks that need to be completed on the job. These tests are typically the best indicators of job performance because they provide important insights beyond surface level appearances and they force employers to evaluate the quality of a candidate instead of relying on unconscious biases. To then evaluate the success of these changes in the long term, the HR department can then use this ATS software to conduct periodic diversity audits. These audits would then examine the personnel data stored in the ATS by race or gender to identify any systemic differences that result in discriminatory practices. From this data analysis, HR would then create quarterly reports based on metrics such as performance, compensation, and promotional opportunities, and then collaborate with the executive team to identify any disparities. The final phase of this process would be to strongly address the culture that allowed sexual harassment and predatory behavior to run rampant within the Mavericks front office. Marshall and her team are off to a good start with their ethics, compliance, and unconscious bias training sessions, but I believe they should take it a step further by conducting bystander intervention and manager-specific training. Traditional mandatory sexual harassment seminars simply have not reduced the number of incidents, with 40% of women still reporting that they have been sexually harassed, and these sessions have even led men to blame the victims themselves. With bystander intervention training, those who have taken part in these sessions have largely reported that it helped them know what to do when they see signs of a problem such as aggressive or inappropriate behavior, which has made them more likely than others to report having intervened in real-life situations. Then with manager-focused training, it has worked very effectively for other organizations because it presents sexual harassment as a challenge that all managers must deal with and not just a select few. Since managers are responsible for all of their employees, this type of training portrays the situations what they might see other people doing wrong instead of focusing on what they themselves might be guilty of. This style has resonated with men in particular because it creates the perception that they are the heroes in these situations instead of being accused of contributing to this behavior. To then evaluate the long-term success of these training programs, the organization should send out quarterly pulse surveys to their employees to see how much progress they are making with reinventing their culture. This feedback will give the Mavericks insight into how well their employees are aligning with their new mission and values while also helping to develop future culture initiatives.